We're now going to have a panel discussion on data science competitions, Kaggle, that kind of sort. And we have a bunch of really awesome Kagglers here and also awesome data scientists that have not participated at Kaggle yet. And then there's me who has done both, but nothing really that well. But uh, we'll see. All right, so here we have Jose Guerrera. He's uh, been a former number one at Kaggle. So that's worth some applause. He came all the way from Seville in uh, Spain. Okay. The next one. Guo Chong Song. He works at ShareDis, and he's currently number 12 or so at Kaggle. Uh, or, highest is eight. Or eight was his highest position, so that's pretty good as well, right? Out of 25,000. <laughs> then we have Mark Landry. He's currently in the top two or three hundred, something like that. He's my buddy. We are together in the team at h2o.ai. That's the team at Kaggle. So uh, he joined up with me, thankfully. Otherwise, I would still be in the slums somewhere. Awesome. He works at Dell, actually, in Texas. <laughs> and then we have Chris Sievers at eBay. He gave a talk earlier on the other side on using H2O in production, uh, using this Krylov system to deploy it. He's a great data scientist and has not participated at Kaggle yet, but he has nevertheless great insights in data science and what tools he's using and so on. And you all know me. Thank you. So we prepared a couple of questions to make it easier for Jose, who has a, his uh, real-time translation helpers here. So the first question will be, how important is it to have a data science competition? And let's answer that with a YouTube video that he suggested. Are we live? But Holland comes in for a pit stop. Time to refuel and change tire. Lou Moore himself changes the tire. Only four crew members, including the driver, are allowed to work on the car. It's a tense time. Holland stays in his seat, anxious to get away. Let's watch. are changed at last. A crewman polishes the windshield as Holland moves away just 67 seconds after he stopped. So that was then. And this is now. So I think this makes the point very clear. Competitions are important. So what is more important to you? Data exploration, feature engineering, feature mining, or is it models, model tuning, or is it just having better algorithms? What is it that is important? Who wants to take this one first? Uh, well, for me, data exploration is important. Uh, and because uh, help me decide what uh, algorithms uh, to try first. My first election are usually three-based methods, 
but uh, in, in some situations uh, with a strong linear dependence with a response, uh, it's better uh, SBM or linear regression. Uh, Okay, uh, for me, I think it uh, depends the, 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 the competition problems. I mean, uh, some, uh, some uh, for example, uh, some competition uh, doesn't, uh, don't uh, give the feature name, so it's whole blend. So that time, I mean, is, I think the algorithm is more important because you use the ones, the better algorithm can do much better than feature engineering because you don't have any insights from, from the features. But some given uh, very rich information from features, uh, then there are a lot of uh, uh, places to do feature engineering. That time, yeah, you get a better feature. You can make a simple model uh, that uh, does better jobs. Um, yeah, I would just say that they're all important and you really need to do them all. Um, that's the danger of creating a tool that is a button press. But um, I have a tendency to spend my time on feature engineering and really what are these important features. Um, you know, you see the same, same algorithm will fail when you throw a thousand columns at it. But if you th start it with the right 100 and then iterate through, it'll actually do better. Um, but like you said, you know, sometimes these competitions, that doesn't work. And the person with the fastest algorithm or the person with the deepest ensemble that started training it two weeks before the deadline, that's the right way to go. Um, and I think in the real world, you have the same thing. It depends on the problem. You know, if you're in the finance industry, you should probably be tuning your model all the time whenever you can. And, and different problems, you encounter them quickly, and that's what I find at work. Um, you know, get in, understand the problem, get out, and, and kind of understand whether your algorithm is working well or not. Is it doing much better than the mean? If not, you're doing something wrong. Yeah, so I'm <clears throat> basically coming from the industry side, I, I think um, most of our work is on the sort of uh, data engineering, feature engineering side. Um, at the end of the day, like everybody has a pet algorithm that they like, but it really doesn't matter that much for us. Um, and actually, a lot of time we get handicapped by like runtime performance or something like this. So having a really complicated set of ensembles or something is just not really tenable for us if we need to come back within five milliseconds, you know, a, a, a billion times a day. Yeah. So from my limited experience, I've noticed that a simple stochastic gradient descent with feature hashing can outperform the smartest gradient boosted model or deep learning model because you have a million categorical features or 100 million, right? And you just can't handle it with uh, 100 million input neurons. So yes, it matters what you're doing with the data. Great, so the next question would be, what are your favorite tools? Is it R, Python, SQL, Octave, Excel, H2O, um, Vopo Babbit? There's different tools that are out there, right? Is, what is your favorite tool, Chris? Um, so Sort of from the, the data engineering, like kind of data munging pipeline, which again, like I think is where most of the work comes in. Um, practically, I, I've been really in favor of, uh, we use a lot of sort of Scala based uh, sort of things that DSLs that convert into MapReduce jobs. Uh, and the, the reason that I like those over something like, and this is, you know, big things, but the, the kind of the reason I've liked these over Pig or Hive is I, I get like type, you know, uh, excuse me, compile time type checking. Right, I don't have to worry about six hours from now, the whole thing blows up because I, I had a tight mismatch. Um, and also in terms of developer time, they're, they're pretty fast. Um, for building models, we're all kind of all over the board. You know, R, Python, uh, H2O is kind of my new favorite, but. Uh, so you're using um, everything for I, model building, whatever think, does the job best. Exactly. Okay, I see. <coughs> uh, I, I tend to prefer R and SQL, kind of I'm just come from a SQL background and I think in SQL and so, Looking at the data set in SQL and I have a, it um, is a common thing for me. Uh, visualizing it in something like Tableau, it could be as simple as Excel or something like that, or just some some R G G plots or something. But when it comes down to it, R and um, you know I'm, I'm new to H two O, but really like a lot of the features there, especially the fact that all day yesterday I was running competition uh, neural networks because it's so easy just to to run those things in there. So. Um, but R certainly, but I think the competition is something interesting, maybe a negative factor is that 
um, you see a lot of different code out there and people are very forthcoming with their code and it's not always written in the language you want. You can go import it if you want to, um, but you know, picking up Python here and there, scikit-learn is great at a lot of things. Um, you know, using different tools is, is something, you should at least have some familiarity to go play around with what you've been given or you'll do the same thing everybody else does. But for me, uh, R and SQL, I guess. So yeah, we have H2O uh, sparkling water, right, which will combine the Spark SQL capabilities with H2O's machine learning. So that will be a good use case for our next Kaggle competition to do it all inside one framework. Great. Yeah, uh, I just uh, 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 want to try some new stuff. For example, uh, the latest competition, I try to use uh, Java 8 uh, streaming uh, API to try, to try something. Because my goal for, for uh, goals for Kaggle is not uh, only to to learn machine learning to to win prize. It's, it's just uh, because you do a data processing. Uh, many many times I got bored, so I, I I like to try some new languages. Maybe next Scala, next Go language to 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 explore new things. Yeah, so uh, typical, I prefer, I mean, I mean, it's not my favorite. I mean, I'm familiar with uh, Python, uh, Java, something like that. Uh, 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 also, I try uh, H2O once. Uh, so, because one competition in which there are more than 500 uh, features uh, with H H2O, I just import the data, I can see a simple stats, uh, what's the minimum, or maximum, mean, average, medium, I mean, simple stats for the, the old variables, and it's a daemon, right? It's run a server, so I don't need, uh, for example, uh, I want to look at again, I don't need to run script to run, it because it's in memory, it's in a server, so I can explore the data more easily, so. So I am still uh, explore new new tools. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, I usually uh, err mainly. Um, I began uh, to learn uh, Python. Uh, I like very much Scikit uh, Learn uh, to Mark, yeah. and I think is a well structured uh, library. Uh, I like uh, learn Python because uh, our management of data are poorly, but since I discovered uh, Matt Doyle data table, I forget to um, learn uh, pandas. Yeah, but that, was, but that was data table was uh, explained earlier, and uh, scikit-learn is a very nice API and we're trying to adapt to that in the next generation H2O dev, so hopefully we'll all converge to something nice that fits the machine learning. Panda. Pandas as well, Pandas. yes, right, the data frames and so on, it's all good. So yeah, we're, um, I'm just using R, and uh, I've used Octave in the past, but not really for machine learning, so I'm a C++ guy, old school, bash, awk, grab shell, all this kind of stuff, but now it's more Java, but I still haven't used as much as I wanted from the new stuff, like Python would be on my to-do list for sure. All right, so feature engineering is important, but should it be automatic or should it be manual? Should, who should do it? How do you do it? Like, why, why don't you just let deep learning take care of it, for example? I agree. <laughs> would be nice, right? I, I would, yeah. I mean, it's the most pain, I think, and uh, I, you know, I, I don't have a lot to back this up, but I, uh, I, I'm curious to see how, like, yeah, yeah, a good, a really good, like, deep neural net would do against, you know, something that's been really well hand tuned, and, um, you know, certainly in the area like vision or something, it just blows it out of the water. So I, I'm curious how that would look in other areas. But yeah, I, I think the the more automated that can get, the the better it is for for industry at least. I think maybe it takes some of the fun out of the competition <clears throat> if it's just whoever can, you know, throw the most GPUs at the problem. Yeah, I mean, as I said before, I mean, I, I prefer the manual feature uh, creation. It feels like, I mean, if you look at data science from, you know, your, the, the 
a commonly cited definition, um, it, it includes that business side of it too, a subject matter expert. And that's what you heard the last panel coming up and saying, like, what are the features? Like, well, why do you have to come to me asking for the features? So um, we're probably getting there. I mean, you know, a common, common methodology, you can try a few different things. Like, let's add, add everything together. With H2O, you can add them all. You got 100 columns, let's find the combinations of every pair in there. Let's do multiplication, let's do equivalence, let's do all those things, but you've got some limit at some point, it feels to me. Now maybe I'm just not looking far enough in the head, but for me, I wanna understand what the data is because I wanna react to it differently. Like should this, even though it's factors, should I be able to cluster it? Is it on a continuous distribution even though I can't see it? Should I put California? and Texas next to each other, or should I put them you know, apart, even though those are hash values and I don't know what they are, you know, that sort of thing. I also have a tendency to, to stay in that side too long and forget to ensemble things together and stuff like that, but I, I think we're a long way from where it's just one appliance goes, um, but yeah, it would be better because it's always up to interpretation. I don't always record my own thoughts. Why did I do it this way? Is that, does that continue to be valid? You know, you may transform something into a log space and then find that you made a mistake early on and you don't need to transform them into a log space. I found that in a competition before. Um, and so what you end up having is you really need almost like this record keeping of what are all the decisions and then I need kind of as my understanding of the problem changes, let me make sure all those, those decisions are valid and if you have an automated framework for that, you know, that, then you don't make as many of those mistakes. Um, so. yeah, in my opinion, I mean, uh, it's very important to understand what kind of feature uh, uh, give a model that can understand. For example, I made a features uh, for logistic regression and uh, make it a, we got a very good results, but I fit the same feature to GBM, then maybe terrible results. I mean, different uh, models can only enter certain type of uh, features. You have to understand the, the the, the internal algorithm, uh, how, 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 how they work. I, I usually I look at uh, the source code, source code the, the open source project I used to understand uh, what kind of feature uh, uh, is better for, for that, that, that model. For example, for logistic regression, you have to take care feature normalization, but uh, you, 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 you don't have to do normalization for tree. And uh, the, the <coughs> uh, but the tree, I mean, so if, uh, if you have a lot of uh, categorical features, it, it will uh, make, uh, make it run very slowly. So yeah, you have to make some feature to uh, lack the, the tree based model run faster, yeah, so it, it's some trick uh, in, uh, there, uh, there, yeah. I prefer uh, automatic. Um, I think when we have a lot of columns, uh, if, if we perform uh, a step-by-step -step, uh, selection, in, in a step uh, we have a, a risk or overfitting, uh, so, I usually uh, use uh, more uh, strong uh, penalized uh, regularization uh, models than do a, a feature selection. Uh, I prefer uh, a lasso uh, regression or uh, a, a more restricted uh, tree-based method. I also wanted to think too, I mean, I think in the competition space, uh, well, there's a couple different ways that they can give you your data in the competition, but, you know, we're kind of all assuming when we answer this question that we have our data in a nice IID, row level, CSV type format, but um, it, for one, the real world doesn't often come that way. It's stuck in databases, it's stuck in different log files. Look, how do I know I've got enough features out of this model? There's no tool in the world that'll ever find that out if all your data is spread across different data sources. Um, and that's even true still of the competition space. You'll find that most people will just ignore entire data sets when you get database style um, competitions. So like the airline data, you know, the, the people that solve that problem, very few of them actually even dug into the weather data at all because you didn't need it to get 95% of the way to a decent solution. 
Um, so feature engineering, if you have all your features there, automated methods are probably good. Um, you know, even them, they don't work. You probably need to rotate your ideas here and there, but that's just scratching the surface of what real feature engineering really is, and that's where do I go to get a feature that represents this thing we think is happening in the real world? And uh, I, I don't know where we're going to be, before, you know, how long it will be before we can automate that. I prefer automatic feature engineering for scaling to solve the quick scaling problem, but for manual feature for, for competition, because everybody, if everybody uses similar technology, how, 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 how do you I mean, make you stand out? Uh, yeah. So I, I try some, I always try some uh, human, human craft features, yeah. <clears throat> Isn't this a little bit specific to the types of competitions that, that you're looking at as well, right? I mean, if the competition was identify these numbers from Google Street View, right, in an image, like you would be silly to not use convolutional neural nets. Like, there's just no way that you're going to get close. Yeah, but uh, some still some trick. For uh, example, for image, you do some uh, uh, some um, how to say that? The, they do like the, some the, sharpening. Yeah, sharpening. And whitening, yeah, 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 whitening. Yeah. Yeah, how many bits? Yeah, yeah, still, uh, still, uh, in yeah. fact, uh, algorithm. Yeah. yeah, sometimes it's as easy as taking an integer number that represents the year, the month, the, the day, the hour, and just cutting it up into these four fields, right? And if you have the periodicity, like in the la latest Kaggle CTR contest, there's such a time integer. But actually, it would be much better if they gave you four numbers and say that's the day of the week, that's the hour, and so on, because people don't click at 3 a.m., right? So these kinds of things will be hard for a deep learning model to pick out. Until, until deep learning knows to pick out the last two digits and remove the rest from an integer, it takes a long net for that, right? So most likely, you need always some humans, unless the feature's already perfect, but we're not quite there yet. Yeah. So how about sampling? We say thank you for not sampling, but maybe it would be a good idea to sample and and get quickly uh, through your feature or th through your uh, hyperparameter tuning on a subsample just to get a rough idea. Uh, do you sample basically or not? Jose? Well, sampling only only useful uh, for take a look of the uh, of data, a fast take a look. But if you win, if you want uh, to win a competition, you need also as much data as possible. Uh, uh, how about, how about sam stratified? sampling is forbidden. What about stratified sampling? Does it help sometimes to rebalance classes and then not take all the data, but at least it's balanced? No entiendo que me pregunta. Does it sometimes make sense to take, let's say, um, you have two classes and you have a million and you have a hundred. And would it make sense to make it, See. let's say, a, a thousand and a hundred, so it, it's more balanced, and then you get better results because it's more balanced? Yes, but I, I don't understand that uh, sampling. Uh, this uh, oversampling, undersampling, yes. but uh, in other contexts, uh, like, like uh, Bach is, is a sampling too. Mm -hmm. But I understand sampling uh, use only a part of, of the of the da data. No. Right. So you most likely would, if you undersample, you still make an ensemble so that you eventually see all the data. Yeah. You won't. Yes. You don't throw away data on purpose, obviously. Yeah. yeah. I, I agree with Jose. <laughs> so uh, as long as the, uh, the data are stationary, then I keep uh, them for the final model. So, but some 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 data uh, uh, have very I mean strong uh, dynamics. So sometimes you use the latest data to train the model can get a better results. But uh, it's nothing to do with sampling. It's data selection. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's it. Like it's if you could sample if if, if you could sample in a, in a smart way. Mm -hmm then I think you're perfectly fine with it. Um, but I think that gets to maybe a more philosophical issue with uh, like how, how we deal with these sorts of problems right now is we tend to just, we don't understand anything at all about the, the sort of underlying space that we're looking at and we basically throw things at it and, and see what's gonna stick. And if, if you're doing that, you probably don't wanna sample because you have no idea what it looks like. Um, if you had maybe some better understanding 
of, uh, you know, not to go to math or anything, but just the, you know, sort of maybe topological properties or something like that, the underlying space, you might know that it's okay, you know, I'm, I'm pretty much smooth and, con you know, continuous and, and flat in this area. Like, I, maybe then I could just sample a couple points, right, and, and be perfectly happy. Save some time. <clears throat> exactly. Um, and, and there's some neat um, uh, uh, stuff that's come out of like um, streaming, you know, clustering algorithms and stuff like that out of Mahout and things like that, which actually sort of use some of these assumptions about real data sets and, and do pretty well, like building sketches. Yeah, we are, I would say the same thing. I mean, I, I, it's easy to sample, especially when you have a large data set, and, but what you'd probably want to do at least is make sure that some chunk that you're using is pretty indicative of the whole problem. So you may try a very naive, simple model. Let's look at the mean as it moves across the data set or something like that and make sure that the chunk you're working on has about the same properties, predictive power, and stuff like that. And if so, yeah, maybe you can just go you know, a, a lot faster iterating through it. But uh, certainly in the competition world, you, you end up, you'll see heuristics like eh, two to one, you know, 66% is about good enough, 70% is probably pretty indicative. And if you have a normal distribution, which a lot of data sets aren't normal anyway, at least perfectly. But even if you do, it still feels like in the competition world, you know, seeing 90% of the data is going to get a better algorithm. If you do like a tenfold cross, cross validation, even doing a 90 10 on a cross validation, I don't want to throw away that 10% of the data, but you have to. <laughs> so. Does it? sometimes makes sense to um, create more synthetic data based on the original data and adding some noise to it just to have better generalization or something like that? I'll take this one first. I mean, it, one of the competitions, uh, the undersampling is a good point too, and, and especially in real world, you know, anomaly detection, fraud, that kind of stuff is very rare. Um, so undersampling seems like a good way to go. I'm not an expert in that one, but in the, one of the competitions that had that dynamic, we tried to use a package that um, you know, was supported by research and, and so where you could over and under sample it and we could just never get it working well enough if we just kind of manually undersampled and rotated a little bit and I, I can't exactly tell you why but uh, it was kind of uh, just left a bad taste in my mouth being able to try that because that's what it was doing is really synthetically figuring out the positives and creating samples that looked like them, but tweaking some different things. So that kind of creating synthetic uh, more of that. And it just didn't seem to work very well. But maybe it does, does work in different algorithms. All right, so you, our next question is, what's your favorite algorithm? Well, uh, I prefer three basic methods, uh, GBM, uh, random forest, uh, second choice uh, is VM support vector machines and regularize the linear, linear method. Uh, the last position, uh, neural nets, I think, are hard to, to conf configure. Uh, parameter tuning is, is very hard to. For me, I mean, it's not uh, uh, still. Uh, I mean, it, uh, it, uh, it's not. I mean, I mean, favorite. I mean, it's not. Uh, I mean, very accurate to say it's favorite models. Just uh, I'm good at uh, very good at uh, logistic regression. I use logistic re regression and, uh, to win uh, three uh, three competitions. I use, I use uh, uh, a tree uh, based. Uh, when once, so usually because I mean from uh, um, more uh, computer science background, I mean it's more like use logistic regression, li uh, general uh, linear model, the statistician uh, better at uh, tree based model. Uh, tree, I, I learned a lot of uh, how to building tree from how science post, and uh, to learn a lot a lot of trick from. Uh, Hosei, Owen, yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah my, my, I have a clear favorite, and it's GBM. Um, I try to use it in places it doesn't belong. Um, but there's a lot of properties to like about it, too. I like actually looking at the data very quickly, because um, kind of as Trevor uh, 
had indicated, you know, it's, it's hard, I mean, it's not hard to overtrain them. There's real noise in real data sets, um, so it, you do have to watch your error, but you get these nice diagnostic reports that pretty much tells you as long as you're testing a, a sample when your GBM has gone bad. And um, so for trying to understand a data set, it gives you importance values back and, and really cool things like that. Um, and it's fast and it can, you don't have to worry about plugging NA values, you don't have to worry about uh, collinearity and you know, all these things that are real things in statistics, uh, trees handle very, very gracefully. So it's a great starting point. And it happens to be a great finishing point on a lot of times, but uh, I'll usually whip out a GBM to start. And then if it goes somewhere else, then I'll see that a ridge regression is a really common example for that to go. And I, I believe in, in deep learning. I want to try it. Is it. H2O is the first time I've been able to try it. So I, I want to see that work, especially I really like um, using kind of ensembles. We heard a talk earlier about like the super learner and uh, I, I think there's a lot of, uh, I, I have a tendency to do that naturally anyway. So I think different algorithms, GBM is a terrible candidate for that, yet I use it anyway. So I just need better algorithms at the bottom to, to try to merge all these independent predictions into one new prediction which can beat any of the in individual ones. So um, trying deep learning a lot now. Um, I, I think my answer is slightly different because I'll just say for, for reasons not related to performance or anything like that, just for kind of sheer cleverness and, and simplicity, I really like random forest. So my answer is actually very similar to these guys' answers. Obviously, they mentioned all algorithms, but that's what I do, right? I run GLM first to get a baseline, and then I run random forest, then I run GBM. Then I try to beat them all with deep learning. That's my personal mission. But usually it, it's not easy, right? Sometimes it's a Higgs data set and you do it easily. Sometimes it's one with uh, 100 million features and then factors in there and so on. Deep learning doesn't have an easy time there. So you always have to balance them. But I usually throw them all in because it's my job to make sure that they all run. All right, so ensembles, we just mentioned a point. Um, what's better? Is it, is it better to have an ensemble of, like, let's say, five models that are all super strong, or is it better to have 100 models that are all really bad, or does it not hurt? Do you have any opinions on that? Well, I, I think, I think uh, both are important. I usually uh, uh, use uh, out of bag uh, predictors uh, using uh, bagging, uh, and, and after that, uh, I, I use a strong, uh, a strong ensemble. I refer uh, a stacking instead of ensemble for difference both. Uh, the K uh, a strong ensemble stacking uh, works is uh, uh, each uh, prediction uh, is uh, honest uh, are uh, independent one of each other uh, this is a decay and begging is a, a good way to to get it uh, as much uh, independence uh, we get with begging in, in prediction, uh, we can uh, use a strongest uh, ensembling uh, method uh, like random forest. We have, um, if we have uh, uh, independent and honest uh, bagged prediction, we can use a random forest. If we have a low, low independence uh, in, in begging predictions, uh, we need to uh, use GAN model uh, with spline uh, with a few de degrees of freedom. And if we have a learner uh, trained over uh, all the data, uh, we need uh, only use linear uh, as a stronger in, uh, stacking. Okay, so uh, example is is very interesting topic uh, because uh, uh, <coughs> because some companies say uh, so it is it's a common question is that Kaggle solution 
uh, are the cargo solution used for, for, for production for, for a company? Some companies say, oh, well, you, most uh, solutions use example. Uh, they require a lot of uh, resources. You have to build multiple models. It, it's impractical uh, in, in production. But this year, this situation changed because uh, Jeffrey Hinden uh, just uh, gave a talk uh, uh, internationally about uh, call, the title is uh, the, the talk title is called Dark Knowledge. So they say Google is using example uh, extensively. So uh, because the example is very, um, I mean, relatively easy way to boost the performance. Uh, just to use some um, computer resources rather than too many human resources. Yeah. So, uh, but I'm not very good at uh, example. I usually I have to have very strong model first, and then try next uh, uh, next next model. But usually I failed. <laughs> um, I, mean, I, I would say both. So, I mean, I like GBM, and that's kind of a, a, an ensemble of some weak learners. Random forest is good, weak learners. Um, but I prefer then to model average or ensemble stack, however your complexity, whatever you have time for, put things together. And so, you know, the general idea of an ensemble is you want things that are different. You know, Trevor spoke about that too. Um, so try a linear model, and, and it's shocking sometimes what the performance difference can be to still get a gain out of using a secondary model. Um, yeah, in production, I mean, you hear crazy stories of, of bigger data sets than I'm used to where building a model with flipping a coin for where your tree cut point or what the, the field is going to be and then flipping another coin to decide where the cut point should be of that field. Doing that over thousands of things is actually a reasonable thing to do in the real world. Um, and not to say the competitions aren't real world, but you know, that some data sets are different. Um, and, and enormous ones, that's so fast that you can get an answer out. And the whole thing is scoring it and putting it together intelligently. But that's so fast, you can beat a lot of other algorithms. But uh, so speed, speed I think, uh, determines a lot of things different, on different problems. Uh, and so um, how, you know, do you really want to have eight fantastic models sitting out there? Do you want to train every single one and realize that you need different feature sets for each one? Yeah, sometimes, but not always. So the next question is, what's the simplest hack you did to win a competition or to re really get up there? What was the easiest thing you had to do and then you were surprised yourself how fast you went up? Do you have anything for that, Mark? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, so I got 19th out of like 500 or so in Excel um, in the last 30 minutes of a competition because the data was set was so noisy. And, and people knew that, but I don't think they really knew that. And so uh, my model was this. Um, I took all the, the, the last point you had seen for a whole bunch of different factors, so a segment and model. And for each one, I manually said, OK, well, should I put that number in? Should I increase it or decrease it by 1%? Or should I increase it or decrease it by 5%? Whatever worked best was my answer. And that's it. And, and that was 19th place. So um, it, and that's the dangers of overfitting. That's something that's been really interesting Anybody who's participating in a Kaggle competition almost inevitably sees these posts that are out there of, oh, the leaderboard shuffling, and you know, it, if you're not crossfold, same, same thing for me in my first competition. I, I actually knew I was overfit, but I know what to do about it. Um, so that, that was one of those examples. People put their fancy machine learning algorithms on it, but there wasn't any fancy machine learning to be done. It wasn't a solved problem that way. It wasn't a solvable problem that way. So you need to be really careful. Um, unless you were excellent. One person did really well, knowing exactly what he was doing, but it's very rare. I have, I have a very interesting experience. In one competition, so I entered the competition very lately, and just uh, 10 days before the, the, the end, the deadline. So uh, I found, so I can build a, a hash table. I didn't use any learning algorithm is pure Python without uh, uh, machine learning uh, libraries. It's just I make a big hash table. Then, then I got uh, the first finish. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, 
the, the first competition I won, uh, I, there was a fisher uh, with uh, some anthropometric uh, measures, and some uh, in, in inch and feet, and others uh, case in, in centimeters. So uh, it is easy to uh, convert uh, both, but uh, the, the model with uh, conversion uh, works from, uh, uh, worse that the 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 model with uh, two two units. So um, I use uh, the original data in, in in centimeters and 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 feet. Uh, I think uh, this is because the data source are different and, and, and this uh, is informate information. So uh, uh, sometimes uh, wrong data is information, missing data is, is information too. Is click competition? Uh, diabetics uh, classification, the first. So that's interesting, inches and centimeters. A little factor 2.5, maybe the data is wrong sometimes, they didn't know what to enter and he makes it up and wins it, right? Not bad. So the next question is what was the most difficult thing you had to do, the most complex operations you had to apply to get up there? Well, uh, nesting in, in, in cross-validation, uh, nesting Fisher engineer, uh, down in each of the fall, and, and uh, after that, uh, uh, parameter tuning, and with the best parameters, uh, do the, the efficient engineer over the, the, the whole data set again. That's what I normally do. I just <laughs> do, I do n fold cross validation grid search, ensembles all in one big fat loop, but I don't think much. I just run, right? And then I have like 600s or something. Yeah, but uh, next time I'll think first. I'll try to do that. Okay, so actually I, I didn't do very sophisticated uh, stuff. Yeah, I think uh, it's reading paper. Paper reading is very time consuming. <laughs> so because uh, there are a lot of machine learning papers but uh, many of paper are junk, so uh, waste a lot of time. <laughs> yeah. um, for me, I, I tend to take the same point of attack. I think one of the hardest things, just to make sense of the data, there was some black hole data, and again, the last panel we were talking about how sometimes it's not big data that requires all the big compute. It, um, so you know, you, you could fit the data set on a floppy drive from 20 years ago, but what you had to calculate based on that was immense, and especially if you coded it in a bad way, and I have a tendency to do that. So looping through this, calculating all these different calculations to understand, to translate um, uh, galaxies in the sky and the different shape of them, uh, I just calculate tons of things. Um, and then also I didn't quite understand uh, for a little while what the problem was, so I spent a lot of time trying to do that, but it was worth it. I ended up doing all right in that one, not understanding how well I was doing, I guess, but, um, but just a lot of calculations, 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 and there was, I think, in the end, no machine learning whatsoever. Um, it's just all about trying to get your data set in order to where the signal really is. So the next question would be, two questions at once, like how much time have you spent at Kaggle in your life? And the other one is what was your first Kaggle? Uh, I'll go first. Um, I, I get asked this question a lot in Austin. People know that I'm the Kaggle guy. Kind of, oh, is it on now? Okay, there we go. Yeah, I get asked this question a lot in Austin. People that know that I show up at the meetups and I do Kaggle. Um, yes, I spend a lot of time on it. Um, it individually on the competitions too, but I mean for me it, it's gotten me where I am professionally too. So I mean, you encounter so many different problems and there's just my way of attacking a problem at work 
is so much more refined and you just have a command of what it is to get that experience. So I think it's very valuable. So um, I started about two years ago, I think, and actually the first competition I did is the one that he won, Jose, <laughs> that he was just talking about, about imputing the NAs. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, quite a bit of time, but I, I enjoy it. Uh, the gamification works for me. Let's see how I climb up the leaderboard. Um, but just rotating through so many problems, you often don't get that at work, uh, maybe consultants, but um, you know, you're stuck with a project for half a year and um, Kaggle, you can rotate out. You see different loss metrics, you see different problems, different ways of doing things. So uh, I think it's worth the time I've spent at doing it and recommend that to other people. Okay, so I think the, I want to answer another question. I mean, so uh, is it worth to spend so many time on Kaggle? So because for each competition, you really is ten or twenty thousand dollars, right? It's winner, winners take it all. So is that financially worth it, right? So uh, I mean, for me, I think uh, I original. Uh, education and uh, working uh, background, uh, I, I was an uh, electrical engineer. I was making Wi-Fi chips. So, uh, so actually uh, three years ago, I, I, I met my current wife. Uh, they, uh, uh, he mentioned me the, the Netflix prize. So uh, I got interested in, in that field. Also, uh, my wife always claimed uh, she uh, she is uh, uh, smart smartest person on the earth, so I want to uh, I wanted to give uh, her answer. So therefore, I, I took uh, Professor Andrew uh, Ng's uh, uh, Costera course, and uh, I know that time I knew the Kaggle, and I think it's a good practice. Um, uh, 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 face so actually it is similar to uh, to is that worse I mean I mean so because usually we encourage people to write open source project it's also free right so actually the the the, the, the what do you want to do I mean the current is, uh, the price is only the current um, uh, reward to you. But actually, the, the more important is what's next to you, I mean, after you spend a lot of time. Yeah, actually, it's, it, 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 it's very, very, uh, very, um, bene very beneficial to me because I, I, I turned my career from electrical engineering to software engineer. For, for Kaggle competitions, um, at the first the competition is Facebook. Uh, friend, uh, friend recommendation that uh, I, I that time I, I, I spent a lot of time on the competition because I can now uh, at that, that time I, I, I couldn't write a very efficient code to, to run right so f the, after that I, I try to uh, to learn programming rather than the maths I, I, I think programming better programming uh, is is very uh, very important to reduce time on Kaggle competition and uh, a better code, I mean, in reduce iteration time and, uh, and uh, I have time, more time uh, to, to focus on the pro uh, pro problem rather than implementation. So, uh, so usually, uh, I usually enter the competition lately because uh, because I do first the prediction for that uh, uh, competition, right? <laughs> so uh, sometimes the data is not very stable at the beginning, so they revise data several times. So I try to avoid that. Uh, <laughs> so usually I I found the data is stable, and also I want to try uh, some topic. Is useful for future. For example, uh, there are some uh, learning to run competitions. Then I, I enter the competition because I want to learn that topic. I read a lot of paper and uh, and uh, and uh, and uh, 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 and, uh, and write my, my 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 solutions to try the the. I think it, 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 yeah, it's very very fun. Yeah, so. <laughs> 
Uh, at the beginning, I spent a lot of time in, in Kaggle. Uh, I was learning, and uh, Kaggle is uh, very addictive. Uh, but uh, last year, at December, I reached the top position, and since then, I have a lot of um, projects and having much time to, to carry. This year, I only play uh, sometimes with, with data for try new tools like string gradient boosting, H2O, and practically in, I, I no compete in this, this year. Uh, I remember my, my first competition, I never, never forget, was a Heritage Health Prize uh, competition, two, two, two years, two years of competition, and uh, the prize uh, was all in. Uh, the winner won half million dollars. I finished third and won zero, zero dollars. So I, I never forget that. Yeah, half a million for the first and nothing for the third place. So that's how tough it is sometimes. Wow. Well, the last question to, to finish this off quickly is, uh, are there any tools that you're missing? If, if you only had this one thing and you could do everything much better, is there such a thing? Is there any such tool that would help you a lot? Uh, for, for me, uh, a thing important is a, a, a con controlling the, the sampling for cross-validation and bagging process. Uh, sometimes data are geographical, time seri series, uh, grouping um, data, and we need all the group uh, are in the same fold, in the same bag of uh, out of bag, and uh, most of uh, of tools. Uh, don't don't have uh, these these options. Mm -hmm. This is important for to get uh, uh, honest uh, cross validate or auto bagging estimation for to do in a second stage uh, stacking with a, a strong uh, method like random forest. Yeah, that's exactly what killed me in the African soil challenge. I just used the random shuffle and I didn't see that there was structure in the data because my, my sampling was just random. Okay, so yeah, I, I also I try try to uh, try to write some some tools by myself. I mean, it's just a script, but. Uh, yeah, so uh, when you enter so many competitions, so I want to some uh, establish uh, data workflow. But also, I also am explore some open source projects. Yeah, you, all, you always have to looking for new tools because you have to make sure you have the, the, the same uh, baseline with uh, other competitors. So H2O is my explanation yeah, as well. <laughs> uh, for me, it's just kind of a, a helper guide. You know, there's so many decisions you have to make as you go through the process. Uh, I kind of alluded to that before, like you do a log transformation and you change your data and you don't need it anymore. Um, you know, things, something to, to help guide you through the process. And so, uh, you know, I've spoken to people about kind of like a workflow tool or something, but that's too simple. Most of the workflow tools don't let you really write, you know, as much arc the code you really want to. but um, so just something to follow along with best practices, like, by the way, you're doing this and you forgot to check that there's, you know, 100% correlation between these two columns, not a good idea, you know, because you forget these as you move around and keep exploring and playing with the data set. So, um, but speed helps. And so I, I think, you know, it, get, getting everything faster allows you to iterate through and think about things more and not wait. You know, this is, you know, again, the last panel, the, the, the rage on the big data, uh, and getting it faster, when's fast enough? Well, a few minutes is what you wanted, and yeah, you could have done that an hour, you know, last week. But speed of thought, you know, when you can get to speed of thought, 
and not forget, you know, uh, you know, that log transformation you did two weeks ago or something like that. That's another way in the right direction and I think that's where H2O helps. You know, you run the model and there's your first cross validation right there. You can kill the whole job when you're done if you want. So um, uh, it helps you keep everything in mind. So. Yeah, so we are thinking about adding some tooling like correlations and stuff that you automatically detect that and then you can like flag and say, wait a second, that's, that's it's happening. Some, some easy things you can do with it that's not that too, too expensive to compute. You arguably should always do, right? It doesn't hurt. Yeah, I mean, I think it, that's why I like GBM so much. You don't have to be careful. <laughs> you can make these mistakes. Um, and I'm not careful enough. That's why these guys have won them and I've only finished in the top 10 or 20 or so. But, um, but yeah, so something to guide you along that process would be really nice because, you know, when you shift between algorithms, which I think we've heard of a lot, you know, these couple days, um, you tend to forget some of the, the things you should have been thinking about as you use a particular algorithm over another one. Um, if you guys just add GPU support, I'd, I'd be happy. GPU support, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we are, we have that on the roadmap. Yeah. Awesome, so thank you very much. I think maybe we can have one question while they, the other guys are getting ready. Okay, so the question was, what kind of hardware do you use to model your Kaggle competitions? I think Jose answered that already to me. He said he has a server in his house, which is a Xeon dual machine, like two 10-core machines, so 40 threads, and 256 gigabytes of RAM. So he has a powerful server, but only one server. With four cores and uh, 32 uh, gigabytes of RAM. Uh, RAM. Oh, wow. I shift mine around, so my laptop, laptop. is an uh, I, I7 with eight gigs will do the trick on a lot of things as long as you're willing to wait. Um, on the bigger ones, for the first time when I used H2O, I actually did spin up the C3, eight extra large, 10 of those in EC2, but it was a quarter an hour uh, on the spot market, so you know, it wasn't so bad. Um, but until then, I had actually never used anything beyond a single laptop. Um, to, to do these, so. And eBay, of course, eBay has a lot of hardware, so. <laughs> yeah, we have uh, 4,000 node Hadoop cluster and uh, 64 <laughs> GPUs. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.